using music to teach the whole child, the body, heart, and to learn new skills and to build new acumen. As the year goes on, I get closer and closer. We can always touch. It's not when you get that, then you get a lot more excited about being around children. Normal, in a sense, and with all of the changes. Of- or how you can transform your own business. On developing the whole time, social, emotional. Traditional route of teaching young people. How to set boundaries because this little victim here needs to know how. Very well. So they use that term. I sometimes expanded them to go up to 40 minutes. See, all of those things in education, of course those things are important. Student is going to our heads and our lungs. The affirmations in the mirror for about two minutes. What did you do in order to get yourself going? This is amazing. It happens what seems to happen quite a bit in our school. For the families to come and they, uh, is that really for the child or is it for us, for the parents? And doing new things for our brain. Who's orchestrating everything in this universe? Which parts of the brain uh, are used? Based on that map that we have. You with your smiling face. At all, thank you very much for allowing me to join you. Namaste to you, my friends. Hello. Hello and welcome everyone. Good morning, good evening to all of you who have tuned in from different parts of the world to our early childhood global spotlight talk show i am atul tyagi i'm also a co-founder of a preschool chain in the name of wow kids having more than 150 centers spread across 20 states of our country and if you're just new here we do these live spotlight shows every sunday 9 p.m my time which is indian standard time and also which is 11 30 a.m eastern standard time in the u.s but this time for some good reasons we had to keep it for today The point of these shows is to simply inspire others and share more and more knowledge on early childhood. And if you have any question during the show, feel free to leave a comment. We would be glad to answer you back. Folks, today we have a very special guest, Mr. Danny Bressels. Hi, Danny. Hey, Atul. Thanks for having me. Appreciate it. Great to see you. Yes, great to see you, Danny. And we also are joined by our very own Marion Herman, and both of us, both of them are from the United States. And before we get started, let me give a small introduction for our guest. Danny is a highly sought-after speaker, trainer, and coach known as Jim Carrey. Jim yeah. Carrey with a PhD. Dr. Danny Bressels has spoken to over three thousand five hundred audience worldwide and authored 16 books, including his latest, Leadership Begins with Motivation. Danny spent 25 plus working, 25 plus years working with students ranging from preschools to rocket scientists. His passion through is with the little ones because they don't know what they can do yet. And he loves their energy. He is the co-founder of the readinghabit.com the world's top reading engagement program. Although he thinks schools do an adequate job to, in teaching kids how to read, the question he always asks educators is what good is it teaching kids how to read if they never want to read? I will repeat that because I have seen this and it's a very, very important question. And we, would, we would love for him to answer that and give us more you know, information about it, that what good is it teaching kids how to read if they never want to read? He teaches kids why to read. The Reading Habit program provides parents easy tips to build positive daily reading habits in children. We welcome Danny on the Spotlight Show tonight, today in the morning in the U.S., we also have our very own Marian Ehrman, who is also a moderator to our group and also the founder of Internationally Respected Music with Mayor program. Hi, Marian. Welcome Hello. to the show. Over to, to you, Marian, to take this forward. 
All righty. Well, thank you, Atul, for, as always, a great introduction. And I'm excited to be working with you again, Danny, um, with virtual walls instead of real walls between us. It's good to see you, and thank you for agreeing to come on. I know you're busy. Um, let's get to the topic about bringing joy back in education. And I know that um, a lot of teachers had their, well, just like everyone else, but in education, world really got rocked because... You still had all these children to take care of, but now you were going to do it virtually. Um, so we had to shift a lot of things to teach with new tools we weren't familiar with. And um, because of that, we had to make these big changes. But uh, along with good, there's all with, I mean, along with bad, there's always good and, and not really good or bad, but negative, positive changes that could be comfortable or uncomfortable. But what are the pros and cons about all these changes we had to make? And again, welcome and just take it from there. Well, first of all, thanks for having me, Marianne and, and Atul. I'm so excited to be here. And thank you all of you that uh, took some time out of your day to be with me. Um, one of the things I've been sharing with uh, virtually to a lot of the schools I've been working with is in in Chinese, the word crisis actually consists of two characters. One means danger, but the other one means opportunity. And while there's all kinds of horrible things happening in the world right now, there's also all kinds of positive opportunities. And so I, I always share a story I used to teach my little ones about the king who had this annoying childhood friend that no matter what the circumstance, whether it was positive or negative, would always say the same thing. This is good. Well, the king was out hunting with his friend one day, and his friend was always in charge of loading the king's rifles. Well, something went horribly wrong on this day, and as the king fired his rifle, it blew his right thumb clear off, to which his friend replied, this is good. The king couldn't believe his ears. He was so angry with his friend, he put his friend in prison. Well... A year later, the king was out hunting in forbidden grounds when all of a sudden he was captured by a tribe of cannibals. As the cannibals tied the king to the stake and put logs at his feet to set him aflame, one of the cannibals noticed that the king was missing his right thumb. Well, being a superstitious tribe, they never believed in eating anything that was not whole, and so they released the king to his freedom. Well, the king could not believe his good fortune. As he was running back to the palace, he recalled what his friend had said a year earlier. So he went to the prison, released his friend, apologized profusely, told his friend the entire story, to which his friend replied, this is good. The king couldn't believe his ears. He's like, how could it be good? I just put you in prison for a year. His friend looked at the king and said, but if you hadn't have put me in prison, I would have been out hunting with you and the cannibals would have eaten me. You know, <laughs> so this is a time where a lot of people are hurting around the world. And we got to pray for those people. This is also a time where we have an opportunity to update our education system to meet the needs of 21st and 22nd century learners. This is good. Good. <laughs> That's my response to you, Marianne. There you go. I, I love the story. Love it. So um, what is the importance of, leads into the next question here, what is the importance of joyful, positive environments in education? Academics, uh, even the academic best versus average or happy kids. What's more? Yeah, so Mary, I'll, I'll teach. I'll teach everybody in the audience. That, uh, this is a trick I used to do with my little ones. So everybody, take out your index fingers right now. Come on, a tool, Marianne. Take out your index fingers. Okay, put them. Put them right now on the sides of your mouth. Okay, now now push. <laughs> we need more people smiling. You know, uh, I see so many miserable people in the world. I always tell people. You know, uh, happy teachers produce happy kids. Happy kids come from California, where I teach. You know, uh, <laughs> our, attitude, our attitude is contagious. And this is what I'm trying to create this new pandemic, this virus of joy around the world. Because I see so many people that think they got it tough. And one thing I've learned in life is no matter how bad I have it, 
there's always somebody else that has it worse. And perspective is a very valuable thing. And so, I, I mean, I think if you want to boost your teaching, it's all with your energy. I mean, people feel your passion. You know, I, I used to ask my colleagues, I'm like, why are my students so hyperactive? Well, it's because I'm hyperactive. You and I, Marianne, we were dueling banjos when we used to present in rooms next to one another. We're, we're loud, we're chaotic. I, I, I was mentioning earlier, <laughs> to you before we went on the air that at movie theaters, before you see the movie, there's always a sign that says silence is golden. Well, not in a classroom, you know, silence is deadly in a classroom. You know, it needs to be loud and chaotic. I want, I want my kids hearing language, especially if you have people that are trying to learn English as a second language or whatever the language they're, they're learning, they need to be exposed to a lot of language and a lot of energy. And uh, that's that's what I'm always trying to create in my classroom is that, uh, you know, a lot of energy, a lot of joy. Um, when I when I speak to uh, different uh, companies, I always ask executives, I'm like, what's the opposite of success? And they always say failure. I'm like, no, it's not. You know, the, to, to succeed, you need to fail a lot. The opposite of success is not trying or quitting. You know, I want my kids I always tell my kids, I'm like, if you're not making 25 mistakes a day, why are you here? That's what school's for is to learn and to grow. And we need to celebrate our failures because it's getting us closer to our successes. And so that's what I try to bring into my classroom every day, Marianne, is that that energy and that enthusiasm. Uh, well, that's my little that's what my little trick. What do you do, Marianne? Sing it. Uh, I'm great. music. I'm yeah. music. So, you know, we meet all of that criteria because you can either succeed individually or you can succeed as a group. And if you make a mistake by yourself, you just keep on trying till you get it right. And and there's that internal joy. Um, and when you're with the group as well. But, mm -hmm. you know, let's talk about um, the joy of reading because now you have um, your energy is, it's almost, it's harder. And I know with online. I get on Zoom and, and I'm like trying to get the kids, jump, jump, you know, like I'm happy, I'm, but it's harder. You have to like do it a hundred percent more because they're yes. not getting that fresh vibe from you, you know, real live thing. So here you are trying to get people to get excited about reading, mm -hmm. but you're online. Well, that's right? fine. So now you're yes, transferring. Exactly. Yeah, it's just a different challenge, Marianne. I mean, uh, you know, it's ironic because uh, people call me America's leading reading ambassador, which always cracks me up because I grew up hating reading. My father is a librarian. I always hated public libraries growing up. They always smelled funny. The furniture was uncomfortable. There was always some elderly woman telling me to be quiet. There's always a, a freaky homeless guy who thinks he's a vampire in the library. I always hated the library. And it wasn't until I started, it wasn't until I started teaching in the inner city where I realized, wow, shame on me. I, I didn't realize all the advantages I had growing up, Marianne. I mean, I, would, I, I, I had both of my parents in my home. We weren't very wealthy, but we never starved. We always had food on the table. Uh, my family always had dinner together. We always talked to one another. Uh, we always had plenty of books around us, and my parents read in front of us and to us. And I realized, wow, I need to spread that joy with my students as well. You know. A tool had mentioned it earlier. And that's the question I always ask teachers. I, I, I mean, I think schools do a, an adequate job of teaching kids how to read. But what good is it teaching a kid how to read if they never want to read? I teach kids why to read because I've never had to tell a kid, go watch TV. I've never had to tell a kid, go play a video game. And I never want to have to tell a kid, go read a book. I want to make reading so much fun for those kids that they choose to do it on their own. And that begins with interest, you know. So Atul and I were, were talking earlier. I've done a lot of work in India. And all I have to do is find out what the kids are interested in. So uh, here's a secret. I always tell teachers and parents, too. I mean, if you're a mom watching, this is very important. Four out of five struggling and reluctant readers are boys. You know, boys and girls are very different. Girls will read books about little boys. Boys have no interest in books about little girls, mm -hmm. you know. And there's a great, actually, there's a great scene in one of the Diary of the Wimpy Kid books, which I absolutely love, where the, the mother decides to create a mother-son book club. And so the mother brings all the books that she wants to read with the boys. And so she brings books like Anne of Green Gables and Little House on the Prairie and Sarah Plain and Tall. And the boys, they bring their books and it's like comic books 
how to cheat at video games, the book of bodily functions. I'm like, that's exactly right. You know, uh, you got to find the interest of the kid. I can't tell you how many 14 year old boys, there's no way I'm going to get this kid to read this textbook. But if I give him a, a manual on how to fix a motorcycle, he'll memorize it from cover to cover because he's interested in it. And so that's what I'm yeah. constantly trying to figure out is, well, what are the kids interested in? Now, is it tougher to teach that way? Absolutely. Because every kid is different, but you know, anybody can be a teacher. It takes a lot of hard work to be a good teacher. Same thing as a parent. You know, I'm a parent of three. All three of my kids are completely different. I have to figure out different strategies with each kid. And that's what we do as teachers all the time. And one of the things I've always loved about you, Marianne, you and I both believe in music. I mean, uh, when I taught middle school, I used to sing with my guys all the time. People can't believe that I sing with, with all age levels. I mean, middle schoolers are always man i hate this man i hate singing songs man you wore that jet yesterday man they always get personal in middle school and then yeah. the one day we don't sing they're oh, like yeah, when yeah. Sing, man yeah and I, I i we always sing and the reason i like singing is it's a great opportunity to be in a group i mean i don't care how rotten your day's been you sing and try to stay angry you know you know we'll It's like, sweet Caroline. I do that all the time with, you know, and my little ones love it even more. But I mean, I, I went the wrong way. I started off as a secondary teacher. Then I went to middle school and upper elementary, to lower elementary and preschool, you know, and uh, like preschoolers and kindergartners, I call it New York, New York. If you can make it there, you can make it anywhere because those kids are nonstop. You got to switch things up every nine oh, minutes. Yeah. They, you know, oh, yeah. uh, little ones, they constantly, like you can't stink. They're, they're sitting there, come on, what's next? What's next? And I love it. I love that energy. And we're, we're going full force all the time. Um, so I, I, I always say that to my early childhood educator friends, you know, you're the best type of teacher. I mean, what works for a, a corporate executive does not necessarily work with a kindergartner, but what works with a kindergartner works with all age levels. Uh, yes, that's yes, very story. well said. Very well said. <laughs> Great point. Actually, actually, very actually. true. So you can, if you can teach children in kindergarten, then you can very well take a conference or you know take a training for adults. Very well. I think it's a great point. Yeah. Because Thank you need you, to. Joel. You, know, you need to. Do you, I, you know every second you have to do try to do something which you know keeps their attention on you? So that's yeah. that's very very important. You can't even miss a second. Three seconds, oh, yeah. one, two, three. You miss their attention and you're gone. So oh, oh yeah, and you have to have well, fun. You have to, as a teacher, you have to have fun with it at all. I mean, I, my students would get bored with me. I'm like, hey kids, you're not listening to me. I'm going to go get Australian Pete to come read to you. I'd leave the classroom, come back in and say, good eye, Mike's just got done putting a shrimp on the bobby. A teacher said, you want me to read to you? And the kid's like, yeah, it's Australian Pete. It's me. Huh. You know, uh, like 2.15 yep. every day, I'd become grumpy old man. I'm like, hey, kid, shut up. I'm going to read to you. Kid's like, yeah, it's grumpy old man. That one got me in trouble with a lot of parents. I'm, oh, I'm not going to invite yes. that guy back. Oh, you. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I got in trouble because... I taught middle school too uh -huh. and moved backwards. When I moved to Florida and they put me in elementary, I was in the principal's office going, let me out. Yeah. You can't teach kindergarten. You can't sneeze because your eyes closed. You just can't do it. You know, so I would do things like that. But I would become my cousin Rebecca from Tennessee. But if they were in a bad mood, I go, don't push it because Mrs. Harmeen will come in the room. <laughs> and I... I had a parent go to the principal because her daughter had nightmares about my evil twin sister, <laughs> Mrs. Harmeen. So, uh, you know, <laughs> all those gimmicks work. You know, Ron Shuali does that all the time, too. You just change your tone of voice. But it also works with parenting, mm -hmm. you know, like our, or sometimes it's the kids are really noisy. And I still I do this with like three and four and five year olds. They won't be quiet. See, this is, and I'll go, it is get that that. See, children, and children. And they're like, what are you saying? And I, go, I don't know. And they all just. Children. Then they zone Children in. love cartoons. Mm -hmm. Okay. They love cartoons. They, they want dramatic expressions. They want that energy all the time. So that's the reason why they love watching cartoons. Because that's uh, where they get their inspiration. And they 
keep seeing what is happening so you know sometimes our teachers we have to just work uh, with the full energy and work like a cartoon and make those all weird faces and weird uh, sounds so that's how it happens so. yeah and I, I, again Phil, you and i talked about this earlier i always tell this to teachers too i mean you know teaching style is very overrated i mean marianne and i are both animated and we make lots of noise and everything but not everybody's like that i've always told teachers if you're not funny don't tell jokes i mean there's nobody that can be better at you than you you got to be yourself i mean some of the best teachers yeah. i've seen are like very dull they're very stern faced and what i always do with them is when i'm working with teachers like that i'm like well embrace it you should make fun of it i mean i had this this one teacher i worked with and she was always like this and i'm like okay we'll tell that to the kids say uh you want to see this? You want to see the quickest smile in the West? You want to see it again? You want to see it? Again? I mean, kids are like, what? You're not smiling. Oh, I smile. It's just really quick. Just play with it. I, I mean, life is too short. I, I always told my kindergartners, I'm like, you know, the average adult laughs 15 times a day. The average kindergartner laughs 300 times a day. So you all have to make me laugh right. 300 times every day. And then the kids are like, oh, we're going to make them laugh. <laughs> so, I love that. I love the energy of the little ones. Yeah, and, and so um, that's the age where they have a desire to learn to read and it gets shut down by the types of books, the joy of reading. See, I had the opposite effect of you lived in a big inner city. My father was like this six foot tall, serious Irish, stereotypical Irish police officer. And he walked me to the library. I still remember holding his hand and he pointed and he said, that's the most important building in the city. Wow. Mm -hmm. And from that moment on, I had to get in there, you know? So there was a desire built there. There has to be a joy. So the joy of reading, you have these guys, kids that they want to read, but then they're told, okay, you have to read this. What do you do? What are the techniques you use to bring the joy to reading like yeah I, well i think that's a great question Brian. i i think that's the biggest mistake most people make is uh, i don't know if anybody in your audience has ever heard of will hobbs will hobbs is a best-selling young adult author he writes books that are especially popular with teenage boys a lot of outdoor adventure books and uh will also happened to be my seventh grade reading teacher in durango colorado and will he he was the Very guy that cool. interested in reading he had five thousand books in his classroom and every day at the beginning of class, he would tell us what he was reading. We would tell him what we were reading. And for the rest of the 50 minute period, we read. And whenever we uh, finish a book, we go up to Mr. Hobb, he put Mr. Hobbs, he put down the book he was reading, look through our book, ask us three or four questions. And if he, if he was satisfied with our answers, he gave us a point. Every book up to 200 pages was worth one point. Every extra 100 pages was worth another point. You needed 25 points to get an A. And the top five point totals had their names written on the board. And I wanted oh, my name big deal. on that board. You know, so 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea by Jules Verne. 500-page book. Four-point book. Also, <laughs> an excellent Disney film starring James Mason and Kirk Douglas. And I didn't really feel like reading a 500-page book. So I took the book up to Mr. Oh, Hall. No. And uh, I learned a valuable <laughs> lesson that day. Books aren't always like the movies. And guess what Mr. Hobbs <laughs> did? He gave me the four points. And that's when I learned one of the best teaching tricks ever. Guilt works because I read every word of every page of every book from that point forward. Wound up with 44 points. Went well above and beyond what I had to do. He used the single greatest reading strategy I've ever seen a teacher use. I'm going to share it with your audience right now. He found out what I was interested in, which was football. And at least once a week, he'd bring me a football book and say, hey, Danny, I think, you, I think you'll enjoy this book. Check it out. What are the odds I open up that book? In my experience, with all age levels, 100%. Kid might not read it, but they're going to open it. And also in my experience, by the fourth time I do that with a kid, they're going to try and read that book because there's nothing more powerful than somebody significant in your life, a, a parent, a teacher, a coach, a pastor, saying, you know what? I was thinking of you when I was reading this. And so that's the strategy I'm constantly doing. I'm trying to figure out what it, it's like going to a, a clothing store. I'm trying to figure out what fits every single student. And when I taught middle school, the way I would do that 
I was the only teacher in the history of my school to have no students tardy. And the reason was because I always started class with a read aloud of Paul Harvey. When I was a kid, I used to listen to Paul. Oh, Harvey. I loved him. He passed away a couple of years ago at the age of 325 years old. And uh, Paul Harvey uh, always had these five minute read alouds where he's like, I'm Paul Harvey with the rest of the story. And so the, uh, the book that I just wrote, The Leadership Begins with Motivation, it's filled with books like, it's, it's like little stories that I read to get the kids interested. So I'll, uh, if, you'll, if, you'll, in, if you'll accept this, I'm gonna, here, I'm gonna read you a quick one right now. So these are the, this is the way I get kids on reading. So yeah. here's one. I read, um, on the morning of January 17th, 1977, Gary Gilmore in a plain t-shirt, strapped into a chair with a bag over his head, awaited a firing squad of five law enforcement officers to execute him at the state prison in Draper, Utah. Convicted of murdering a gas station employee and motel manager in Utah the year before, Gilmore would be the first person in the United States to be executed in nearly a decade. Shortly before his execution, prison officials asked Gilmore if he had any last words. Neither he nor anyone else that day would know the impact of those words. Over 10 years later, in 1988, Dan Whedon, an advertising executive who co-founded the Whedon and Kennedy Agency in Portland, Oregon, made something of a morbid pitch to a struggling fashion company. He recalled the inmate's final words and used a slight variation for his pitch, and seemingly everyone hated his idea for the company's new slogan. Just trust me on this one, Whedon implored the company's co-founder. And the co-founder, his company, and the public have not looked back since. The co-founder's name was Phil Knight. The struggling brand he co-founded was a shoe company called Nike. And advertising executive Dan Whedon slightly altered death row inmates Gary Gilmore's final words, let's do it, into the phrase, just do it. The phrase has become Nike's signature slogan, helping to turn a niche brand into a global multi-billion dollar giant and etching the phrase indelibly into consumers' minds around the globe. This is how I get kids excited about reading, is now they're interested in learning more. Uh, some of my boys especially are gonna be interested because they know Nike and they know athletics and stuff. And so that's what you do, is you, you share that passion. I mean, Marianne, I guarantee you a lot of your students probably didn't like singing, and by the end of a year with you, they love singing. Um, my pastor says it best, he always tells parents, he's like, parents, you have the greatest home field advantage in the history of the planet. You could be the worst parent ever, but your kid doesn't know it. To them, you're mom or dad. And that's our power. That's our impact. When kids are with us every single day, they're watching us. You know, this is why reading is so important to me. I always tell parents, kids aren't stupid. They don't see us reading. They're never going to be reading. So if you want your kid to be a reader, you need to be a reader in front of your child. And if, if you either read in front of them, read little short stories like that to them. I mean, uh, a tool, I'm writing a new book. And it, it focuses a lot more on stories like that, only from people around the world, a lot more women, a lot more minorities. And there was this, there's this great story, and I'm sure you're familiar with it, because it took place in, in Northeast India. There was this uh, poor farmer, illiterate farmer, and in 1978, he, on, his, on his island in the river, it was a horrible drought, and he saw like 200 snakes had died because the sun was so bad. And so what did he do? The next day, he planted a tree. And the day after that, he planted a tree. 50 years later, the guy's been planting a tree every single day for 50 years. And about 2008, the Indian government decided, all of a sudden they discovered there was a, a herd of 100 elephants in this sanctuary. There's now a forest in Northeast India, which they named after this poor peasant that's over 2,000 acres. He's got like jaguars, all these rare birds are living there. One man single-handedly created a forest in India. If that poor illiterate farmer can do that, I always tell this to my little students, what do you think you can do? All of us have the ability to have a huge impact on the world. And with little ones, the first one I always say is, hey, you have no idea just giving a smile to your mom and telling you you love her, how that's gonna impact her entire day. So it's little things. Uh, I'm sorry, you always ask short questions. I give long answers, but I get very excited about well, it. <laughs> that's that's what I like. That's, that's what we need. So yes, that kind of that's what we need. Like, you've traveled around the world, um, and we have people watching from around the world. We have a, um, someone from Pakistan that just commented to you, and 
We have people from um, Egypt, um, India. And so parents, teachers all over the world have the same concerns, no matter where they are. So the same philosophy applies across the board to everyone. Have you found some things that are different, that stand out? Or is it just basically give my child the best I can? Yeah, it's amazing, Marianne. I'm, I'm very blessed. I'm a visiting distinguished professor at the American University of Cairo in Egypt. And when I was in Egypt right before the pandemic hit, I was, I was blessed. I got to speak to a lot of uh, uh, private Islamic schools. And it was incredible. I had this one audience of, of 400 parents showed up at two in the afternoon for a training from me. It was amazing. Uh, the, mm-hmm. It was like the Islamic Brotherhood. All the men had the long beards and all the women were wearing burqas. And we were talking like this. And I thought that was so important for me to see. I'm like, shame on me. I had all these preconceptions. And all of a sudden I found out my my Muslim friends are just like you and me. They they had the same concerns as parents. And I shared with them a story. I'm like, happy. I was reading this book recently. I don't know if any of you have ever read it. It's called The Quran. And they all laughed. And I said, oh, well, then, you know, you know, the story in the Quran when the archangel Gabriel appears to Muhammad in the cave. What's his first instruction of Muhammad? Because the first pillar of Islam is to read. And so I told the parents, I'm like, so not only should we get our kids reading, it's actually written in your most sacred text that it's your duty to get kids reading. And everybody's like, oh, my God. And I'm like, See, the more we're different, the more we're the same. I don't care where I've been in the world. Every parent wants their kid to have a brighter future. And that's what I, I love that. And I love you know, I know a lot of parents are watching right now, and I want you to know you're doing fine. You know, there's no manual teaching you how to be the best parent. You can only be the best parent that you can be. And that's that's the standard you have to hold yourself to is don't compare. You know, President Teddy Roosevelt said comparison is the thief of joy. You know, don't compare yourself to other people. Compare yourself to you. Can you be better today than you were yesterday? This is the same thing I teach. I always teach kids. You know, no matter what age I'm teaching, whether it's my little ones or my older ones, as they exit my classroom every day, they have to hear me say the same thing. I always remind them, remember, kids, education is valuable, but execution is priceless. Knowledge is not power. Only applied knowledge is power. Knowing what the right thing to do and doing the right thing are two different things. So go out in the world and do the right thing, be the difference. That's what I always tell my kids. And I would say the same thing to any parent out there. You gotta be a better version every single day. Again, long okay. answer to a short question. I think very, very important that uh, you're giving a lot of motivation to us that books can give you knowledge, but if you don't execute all that knowledge, all the good things that you learn from books, then I think it's useless. So execution is very very important absolutely very very important you can have there are there are there are millions of books who can you know which can really ignite that passion within you but a lot of us you know we keep thinking and we keep thinking and keep thinking and finally no action no action but then that's very important so even teaching this to the children that go out and execute is also very very important absolutely Absolutely. I actually, you know, before I forget, I wanted to offer all of your uh, all of your audience. I wanted to give them a couple of freebies for joining me and for, for being patrons of your show. Uh, if, if your audience goes to freereadingtraining.com, freereadingtraining.com, I'm going to give you three goodies. First of all, I'll give you a complimentary e-copy of my book, Read, Lead and Succeed. It's a book. I wrote it for a school principal who didn't know how to engage his faculty. So I said, OK, I'll write you a book. So every week I give you a concept an inspirational quote, an inspirational story, a book recommendation on a book you should read, but you're probably too lazy because you're an adult. So I also give you a children's picture book recommendation that demonstrates the exact same concept. You can read that in five minutes. I'm also going to give you access. I don't know if it's giving you access right now because in a couple of weeks, starting July 19th, uh, we're doing a, uh, a five-day Get Your Son to Read challenge in five days for parents, uh, especially moms, because that's usually the tough one is moms trying to figure out how to get their boys reading. And so that's my specialty is I just give uh, real real easy tips for any parent. Uh, you know, you don't have to have a – you don't have to be a, have a PhD to be a really good parent. You just have to care. And uh, I mean, what I love is 
in my reading engagement program, I've actually taught some parents how to get their kids to be really good readers. And the parent themselves didn't know how to read. But this is what you have to understand. Just holding a book in front of your face and showing enthusiasm for that book, that'll get the kid interested in the book. It's real easy little tricks that, you know, one of the tricks um, I always give people, parents will, here in the United States, parents always tell me, oh, I got nothing to read at home. I'm like, oh, I bet you, you do. You know, a lot of people don't know in the United States, for the last 30 years, there was a law that every television set has to have closed captioning, subtitles at the bottom of the screen. I always tell parents, turn on the closed captioning, and parents say, well, wait a sec, if the show is in English and the subtitles are in English, what good does that do? I'm like, well, that's a fair point, but let me make a point. How many of you have ever watched a show with subtitles where you didn't look at the subtitles? That's very difficult to do. Your brain is directed towards the text. Mm -hmm. And there's actually research that supports this. If you look at world reading scores, the more kids watch TV, what do you think happens to their reading scores? Do they go up or do they go down? They go down in every single country in the world except for one. The country with the highest reading scores watches the most TV. It's Finland. How can that be? Well, Finland makes really bad TV shows. So they have to import all these old American shows like Brady Bunch and Gilligan's Island, and they have subtitles. The kids are reading the subtitles all the time. It's a really easy trick for any parent uh, that has access to a television. Um, you know, when I'm in India, a lot of the parents, there's a really great oral storytelling tradition in India. And I say, that's great. Yes. Tell your kids stories. You know, kids need to hear about, you know, I always tell, so, I always tell teachers, you know, how do you ever expect a kid to share stories with you if you you never share stories with them? When I was a first grade teacher, the silliest thing I ever said to a group of first graders, I looked at my kids one day. I said, "Okay, kids, write about your lives." And they look at me like I'm from outer space. They're like, "We're only six. Nothing's happened to us." I'm like, "No, no, no. Things happen to you every day." I'm like, "When I was in first grade." I had a teacher, she called me stupid in front of the class. She smacked me on the hand and she got me to cry in front of everybody. So the next day I was walking to school and I had an apple and I, I peed on the apple. I, I, I delivered the apple and gave it to her. She ate the apple and said it was the best apple she had ever had. And my first graders are like, that is awesome. You know, this is also the reason I've never accepted food from a child, you know. But again, <laughs> if you want kids to give you stories, you got to give them stories. So, and again, it should always be fun. I mean, if it's not fun, you're not going to do it. Really, the basis of everything I do is habit formation. You know, you have to create positive daily habits. You can create negative habits, but you can also create positive habits. But it's about consistency and routine. And if I'm not having fun doing something, I stop doing it because I know it's never going to last. Um, so these are just some of the little mm -hmm. tricks for, for parents and teachers out there. So mm -hmm. I, I appreciate all the questions That's you guys are asking. Great. Great. That's really, really great. I think a lot of information. So the, can you tell us a little more about this? A uh, reading workshop that you do. Uh, sorry, Marian, uh, but it's, <laughs> I, I seem to get you know. I this was is just a very, very ask important if we were going to put the. I, I was just going to ask if you were going to put the URL for the freebies across the bottom. Oh yeah, yeah, sorry. Yeah, yeah. Free reading training. I saw you typing it up after all. Yes, uh, free reading. Yeah, freereadingtraining.com. And again, in a couple of weeks, we're going to do a five-day challenge where every day for an hour, I'm going to give some new tips for people uh, to get their, their, especially their son's reading. Uh, basically, my reading engagement program, there's two numbers I always focus on. So the first one is 67. It, it's designed to last 67 days. And people always ask me, well, why 67 days? Well, a lot of people will tell you it takes 21 days to change a habit. And to those people, I say, show me the research. It's actually, it's a bogus, uh, it's a bogus number. I actually know where the number comes from. It comes from a wonderful book written in 1960 by Dr. Maxwell Maltz called Psycho Cybernetics. Now, Dr. Maltz was a plastic surgeon. And in the preface of the book, he wrote that he noticed it took most of his patients about 21 days to get used to their new faces. Well, a lot of self-help gurus, people that I respect, took this number and started telling you, oh, it takes 21 days to change a habit. But there's no research whatsoever on that. So back in 2009, researchers at the University of London did a habit formation study, and they found it took anywhere from 18 
to 254 days to change a habit, and the average was 66 days. Well, I don't like the number 66, so I threw in a bonus day, 67. And it, it depended on the habit you were trying to change. So for example, if a tool, you decide you wanna drink a glass of water before breakfast every day, that might take 18 days to make that into a habit. But let's say Mary Ann wants to quit smoking. Well, that's gonna take 250, not, not that Mary Ann smokes, but uh, <laughs> if, if she wanted to quit smoking, that's gonna take 254 days to change a habit. And this is why this is important. Let's say I go on a diet and I follow it religiously for 21 days, but on day 22, I fall off the wagon. Well, I blame myself, which is absurd because research shows it takes at least three times that long on average for people to form habits. So yeah. my program takes 67 days. And then the other number I always encourage parents and teachers to pay attention to is 20. So uh, researchers around the world were looking at habits of successful students. They were trying to figure out characteristics and they discovered one which amazed them. It was the number of minutes spent reading outside of school. So they looked at the lower students, the average students, and the higher students, and they were startled by the results. So the kids at the bottom of the class, around the 20th percentile, how much time do they spend reading outside of school every day? Well, the average is less than a minute a day, which that doesn't really surprise anybody. That's why those kids are at the bottom of the class. But this is what did surprise people. The kids in the middle of the class, the average students, the C students, how much time do they average spending outside of school every day? It's 9.6 minutes a day. And so when I'm doing a live training, this is usually when the first parent raises a hand and says, wait a second, are you saying if I can get my kid to read for 10 minutes at home every day, I can take him from the bottom of the class to the middle of the class? That's exactly what I'm saying. The research is pretty conclusive on this, but this is even more startling. The kids near the top of the class, in the 90th percentile, do they spend three hours a day reading outside of school? No. Do they spend one hour a day outside of school reading? No. The average was just over 20 minutes a day. This is my goal for every parent. I'm like, 20 minutes a day. We're going to find 20 minutes to get your kid reading outside of school. And here's what's great. Two things. First of all, being read aloud to is just as good as the kid reading on their own. So if a parent is driving their kids to school every day, it takes 10 minutes both ways. I'm like, put in an audio book. You just covered your 20 minutes to and from school. Um, the, the other thing is they don't have to be consecutive minutes. So maybe you only have two minutes at... 7 a.m. every day and five minutes at noon and 10 minutes here, they can be stacked throughout the day. So it's all about building positive habits, you know, and I, this is really important. It's a whole lot easier to build a positive habit in a child than to destroy a bad habit. Our job as parents, our job as teachers is to build positive habits in our kids, you know, so everybody in your audience, they're, they're watching this podcast, this, it's not really a podcast, the Facebook Live every week. That's a positive habit. This, you know, this, I like being around people that aren't complacent, people that constantly want to learn and get better. So this is a positive habit. But like if after the, uh, the Facebook Live, you, you go out and get drunk, well, that's a, that's a negative habit. You know? So <laughs> what we're trying to do is, is to, to form positive habits with our kids. And, and as parents, it's good for us to always model positive uh, habits in front of our kids. So again, very long answer to a short question. <laughs> but absolutely, why you've given so many uh, strategies to all of us, even, you know, we want to inculcate this habit. And as you rightly said, this has to be, you know, parents will have to lead by example. You can't just give them a book and, you know, tell them to read it. You will have to, and especially you told, I think 20 minutes per day is, I realize because I'm I'm a father to twins who are uh, turning nine in a couple of days. So twenty minutes. Are very, are very, boys or girls, at all? A boy and a girl. Okay, good. Yes. Are you? So, so I, think, I used to run a nonprofit called Real Dads Read, and I used to always challenge dads at all. I'd say, Hey, Dad, you want to know why your kids like read like like uh, football so much? It's because that's the only time you spend with them. If you spent your time reading with them, they'd want to be readers. So your twins, your nine-year-olds, they're watching you, you know. And so one of the things I would I would encourage you to do a tool, and you're probably already doing it, is my favorite time of day is reading with my kids. And so I have three kids, and so uh, each kid I have a different book that I'm reading. So my my oldest daughter is 17, and we're reading this series. Um, I think it's Shadows. And Shadows and Bones is what it's called. So I read that with Kate. My son 
we're reading The Killer Angels, which is about the Battle of Gettysburg. And so I read that with him. And then my youngest daughter, we're reading Around the World in 80 Days. And so, I, and even with my wife, my wife is a big fan of Diana Gabaldon. So we're reading the Outlander books together. But this creates personalized relationships with important people in my life. Mm -hmm. It's the same thing I do when I when I thank people. I always uh, I always send them a book and I always write something in the book because I've never I've gotten lots of books sent to me. And when a book is like, uh, oh, here to Danny, I was thinking of you when I was reading this. That's a book for life. I'll never get rid of that book. I think amazing. That's fantastic. Yep. That's my dad used to on uh, parrot night. They would go in and they would get the report card. And they always strategically had the book sale set up on parrot night. Smart. And my father would always come home with a new book for me and tell me he was proud. I'm proud of what the teacher had to say about you. Here's a new book. And to this day, I still have them. I have saved those books because what's, what do they say? If it doesn't bring you joy, throw it out. And so... I have a lot of stuff in my house because everything brings me joy <laughs> because it comes comes with the memory. Mm -hmm. So you create memories. My daughter and I read all the Laura Ingalls Wilder books, mm -hmm. all the way starting from the little girl ones up into teenagers. And when we were cleaning out and donating books from her childhood, she said, don't get rid of those because I'm going to read them to my child. Oh, wow. You know, so oh. it's traditions get passed down, and, um, right? And your son someday, you know, is going to be reading to his children, too. So it's a beautiful gift to give books. We, I like combining books with music. You know that. My of wide mouth bullfrog and all, you know, but people remember. And children well. are wanting to read because you attach joy to it and not yeah. just joy, but the attachment of your attention. They have all children, what is that quote? Children spell tie, spell love, T-I-M-E. No, yeah, and I love that. In the book and singing the song, which uh, I was giving them, right? Well, you bring a good point up, Mary. T-I-M-E. Yeah, uh, you also bring up a good point, though, and I want the audience to really listen to this. Reading doesn't have to be narrowly defined as books either. You know, I know plenty of, of kids that they don't like reading books per se, but I can get them music lyrics and they'll read music lyrics or I can get them uh, yeah. reading comic books. It's always huge. I mean, when I when I do corporate trainings, I always ask the executives, I'm like, what was your favorite book? growing up and 70% of the audience is like Fantastic Four, Spider-Man, Batman. I mean, those count. Um, and so, you know, or my, my parents, my mom growing up, mm -hmm. my mom has never received a, a piece of mail that she did not feel compelled to read aloud to every single person in the room. So she read aloud to us all the time. She'd read aloud newspaper things uh, all the time. And so there's all kinds of different uh, things. I don't, I, I was working with a fourth grade boy and his teacher's like, Deshaun don't know nothing. He don't know how to read. Well, I, I spent one hour with Deshaun. And Deshaun, in, in one hour's time, he texted about 10 of his friends. He sent some emails. He was surfing the net. He's highly literate. She's using a definition from 100 years ago. It doesn't have to be narrowly defined as just a book. I mean, I can't think of the last time an executive had a boss say, I need you to read this novel by Nathaniel Hawthorne. Pronto. No, they don't do that. They say, here's report. I mean, there's different types of reading. And so really what I'm trying, what separates my program from every other reading program I've ever seen, most reading programs are, are either teaching you how to read or how to uh, overcome some kind of reading disability. And every, every reading disability is curable, but they don't really attack the root cause, which is, I think a lot of kids know how to read, but they choose not to because they they don't find it interesting because they're being force fed. You know, when I was in high school, I had a teacher force me to read The Scarlet Letter by Nathaniel Hawthorne. Now, no offense to that book. I know plenty of people like that book. It's a story of Hester Prynne has committed adultery, so she's forced to wear an A on her chest. And I, I told my teacher, I'm like, I need to wear a B on my chest because I'm so bored reading this book. I mean, it got me <laughs> hating reading. Uh, and I don't ever think, 
you know, the, the research is really clear on this. It doesn't matter what you read. What matters is how much you read. It doesn't matter if you're reading James Joyce or James and the Giant Peach. People who read more read better. I always tell moms, the little boy who's only reading Captain Underpants is going to be a better reader than the little boy who's not reading anything. I mean, Captain Underpants is the gateway drug to Shakespeare. We need to recognize <laughs> we got to get kids yeah. interested in first. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah, and uh, um, uh, late in the game, but they also found that this is why on the SRA test that we used to take, where they make you read these passages, and then you have to answer these questions, and the passages were so freaking boring. You know, like <laughs> Aqualung was developed because, and it didn't, and then somebody genius thought, let's make these paragraphs something that will get their attention. And then they realized the children weren't doing poor on reading, we're just doing poor on what we were having them read, yeah. right? So I know it's a, a tour, we're like at 50 minutes here. So um, we, we could keep on going. Um, moving enjoy. forward, you might you wanna suggest, um, the books, I, I know you have several books. Where can teachers find your list of books that you do, all uh, that? And we will put it up for in the Well, again, comments. if you just go to free reading training, yeah, if you go to free, thank you, Marianne. I mean, if you go to freereadingtraining.com, everybody's going to get a complimentary e-copy of the Read, Lead, and Succeed book. And so that has information on there. Really, I came on because I really wanted to serve you. Uh, and the audience. We're doing this uh, reading challenge in a couple of weeks. Uh, you know, uh, get your son reading in five days. Um, you know, it's not rocket science. It's it's just some very practical things. Uh, it always cracks me up when our program is implemented in schools because teachers will say, wait a sec, this isn't too hard. I'm like, it's not meant to be hard. You know, they're like, well, I could do this on my own. I'm like, well, do it on your own, but you won't. You know, I have a, an accountability system. We can make sure that you actually do it. Um, and that's the important thing. I mean, knowing something and actually doing something are two different things. I keep people accountable. And uh, my favorite story is we had a, a third grade boy, Michael, and he was at the bottom of his class and his mother was fed right. up. And so she put him in our program. And after only 40 days, just over a month, his teacher calls his mom and says, um, what, what, what medication do you have Michael on? And she's like, I don't have him on my medication. She's like, no, don't you have him on Ritalin? No. She's like, well, what are you doing with Michael? Because in the last month, he's gone from the bottom of my class to the top of my class. Well, I thought that was great. But there's two things that really got me excited about Michael. First of all, he got so excited about reading, he started his own little book club with his buddies. And now this teacher's winning all these awards from the district because she's got the best readers in the entire district. It has nothing to do with her. It has to do with our reading program got the kids excited about reading. But what really, really impacted me about Michael, Michael's mom doesn't speak a word of English. She only speaks Spanish. Michael watched my videos on, on his own. I mean, the videos are meant for parents. They're not meant for the kids, but I guess I'm entertaining enough the kids like them too. But that, that like touched me so much that uh, we translated the entire program into Spanish. So here in America, the program's in English and Spanish. Uh, we're doing a lot of work right now in, in Tamil Nadu and in, in Southern India and stuff. So we're, we're considering translating the, the entire program into Tamil. Our work in, in, in Pakistan and, and in Egypt and in the Middle East, we're starting to uh, look into uh, translating into Arabic. And uh, I'm really excited. Uh, we've, we've joined forces with this wonderful program called Cyber Smarties by my dear friend, Dermot uh, Hudner, which is basically a social media platform for kids that teaches kids how to be kind on social media. And Dermot's program has actually eliminated cyberbullying in Ireland. And now we're introducing the program throughout Africa and Pakistan, Indonesia and India. And I'm really excited. Again, what I'm interested in is positive habit formation and parents out there and teachers. There's so much stuff that overwhelms you. This doesn't have to be that difficult. You know, uh, your caring heart, your your desire to get better, that's what's going to really improve your child. So, again, long answer, Mary uh, uh, <laughs> and a tool. Just go to, just send everybody to freereadingtraining.com. That's That'll very fun. Yeah. 
Oh, and thank you to the people that are sending nice comments. I'm you see you this a- comment, Danny? Thank you, Preeti. I appreciate that. This is Dr. Kathleen, friend. She is also a book writer. Uh, Great. She's also there with us. Yeah, thank Dr. you, Dr. Kathleen, Kathleen friend. I appreciate that. Yes, yeah, she no, it, has a book in the name of The Greatness Chair. What's, what's book, that? Uh, the Greatness Chair. It is for young children. Great. I think, uh, Marianne, the it's book a, is also on a, a similar a, line. Really? Yeah, and I, I, I can send you to one other resource one if you'd the, like. I have the, uh, uh, one book. of the top book clubs online. It's called it's LazyReaders.com. Easy. If you go to LazyReaders.com, it's a free subscription. Once a month for the rest of your life, I update it with 10 book recommendations, three or four adult level, three or four young adult level and three or four children's level books, all under 250 pages. So you have something you can read when you're stuck in a boring meeting. Uh, Again, a lot of people, they think that reading has to be Dostoevsky, but I'm like, reading can be a comic book. Reading can be reading something positive every single day. I mean, uh, I I think it's really important that, uh, you know, I always tell this to the kids, you are what you read, good stuff. So stop reading negative things. You need to, uh, you know, stop watching, turn off the TV news and read a funny children's book every single day. Read, yeah, yeah. read Dr. Kathleen's book. It's a positive book. You want you want things that are, are uplifting people, not not tearing them down. I mean, that's that's my vision of the world. I mean, I have I, I'm, a, I'm an ambitious person. My, my goal in life is that someone go. that goes through my reading program one day wins the Nobel Peace Prize. And I'm completely serious about that. Is this is this is what I want. I don't care where they come from. I I, I I believe that this is what's beautiful about this this Facebook group is right now there could be some some uh, poor kid in in some impoverished part of the world that's on a, a dirt floor, no shoes, hasn't eaten breakfast. But if that kid has a laptop and an internet connection that kid has the exact same access as the president of Google. The world just got a whole lot smaller. You don't have to be born in New York City anymore to make a difference. You can be in Goa, India. You can be in Cairo, Egypt. You can be in Lagos, Nigeria. And I, for one, get really excited when I think of the possibilities about that. Well, you have definitely made a new friend from uh, Pakistan today. Um, <laughs> yes. His name Uru? is Uru. Uruj Iqbal. Uruj. Yes. Yes. Oh, thank you, Uruj. Yes, I appreciate you made a new that. friend here. <laughs> thank you so much. We so, also um, have closing uh, words. Famida Sheikh. She also thank you, Famida. I appreciate that nice comment. Well, you can um, go online afterwards and see all the wonderful things people have had to say. You can respond. You You can um, put in any um, URLs we may have left out or book recommendations. Um, I, I think some people are asking about, somebody said, looking forward to taking your workshop. So... I don't know what yeah, you have. That's a, it'll be the, yeah, July 19th. We're doing a five day challenge online an hour a day. I'm going to give you, you know, all kinds of long answers to get uh, your kids, your, especially your sons uh, pumped up with reading. And, and don't get me wrong. There are some girls that, uh, that don't like reading either. Uh, I used to volunteer with uh, at a juvenile detention facility for teenage girls. And the way I got them hooked on reading was in the back of Us Magazine, there's this thing called the Fashion Police, where it's comedians uh, picking apart celebrity outfits. And these girls couldn't get enough of that. They were laughing every single day. And that's really what I want to do. I want to get kids excited about reading. And I don't, I don't care, uh, as long as it's positive, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do that uh, in any way possible. I don't, I don't believe in negative stuff. But I used to tell my kindergartners, I'm like, you know, you have the rest of your life to be miserable. This year, we're laughing. You know, uh, every year we're going to get a little bit better. Um, so that's what uh, there's too much negativity in the world. Keep yourself uh, surrounded. Uh, Atul and Marianne, I appreciate that you've had me on and that you're providing this service to everybody. You've got to keep everybody positive and, and growing. Thank Great. you. Uh, what I had to say is wonderful. I look forward to a day when I can work with you again, adding the music piece behind um, everything so we can continue to give children the joy of music and books. You have such wonderful advice 
and you're just a friendly, giving person. And that makes yes. it easier to learn from you. Whole you. conversation itself was so joyful. <laughs> Absolutely. And uh, we had this amazing talk today on uh, Spotlight talk show with, uh, with, with Dr. Danny. And my sincere thanks to Dr. Danny for uh, joining us today and also Marion for taking your precious time out for our global community. I also thank all the viewers on Facebook for taking your precious time out to watch this show live. Our heartfelt prayers, warmth, and best wishes. Until we meet again next week, thank you. Bye-bye. Namaste. Cheers. Ciao.